um, uh, she will talk uh, about the uh, uniqueness theorem for static black holes. Thank you. Um, so after the last class, three questions were raised to me that I thought would be interesting for everybody. There were also other questions raised, but uh, they were, I think, more specific. But these three I want to touch on today before I continue with the planned content for today. And one question was, why did we look at this conformal extension of the Schwarzschild spatial slice yesterday? Because there's this much better extension by Kruskal, the Kruskal extension. And why, why wouldn't we look at that instead, which is because it's much better? And the answer is, this conformal picture will appear in the proof tomorrow. Um, so we need it for the proof. We also already needed the conformal coordinates on Schwarzschild for defining asymptotic to Schwarzschild, last, last class. And also, uh, we, we are interested mostly in the Riemannian picture, so the, the Lorentzian generalization by Kruskal is not so relevant. But for those of you who are familiar with Kruskal, I just want to point out that you can recover this doubled part of the spatial Schwarzschild slice in the Kruskal extension. So if you look at Kruskal, then this part here, get colors. This part here, t equals zero and r bigger than 2m is the part that we rewrote in isotropic coordinates, and then we doubled it. And in fact, when we double it to get a geodesically complete Riemannian manifold in the Kruskal picture, this means we added the reflected line piece here. So this then would be t equals 0 is less than m over 2, where this was equivalent to s bigger than m over 2. So the Kruskal picture in contains this doubled part. But we will not make use of the Kruskal picture, just for those who know. The, the second question I was asked was, are black hole horizons always compact in the spatial slice, the intersections with the spatial slice? And the, the answer to this is, in my talk for sure, otherwise I'm not an expert, so I, I'll not comment. And in my talk, all the space times we will look at have asymptotically Schwarzschildian Riemannian time slices. And then we asked, in the definition of that, that they split into a compact, so M N can be written as a compact set C, this joint union with this end E N, which was diffeomorphic to R N minus a ball. And if you look at this, now if this has a boundary, the boundary cannot occur here, because this is going out to infinity, so the boundary will be a component of the boundary of the compact set that does not attach to C, okay? Uh, to E, sorry. So here's a picture. So for example, this could be our compact set. Uh, sorry, no, this could be this part down here under this plane could be our compact set C, and then the remainder of the manifold up here is, is isotropic, uh, uh, diffeomorphic to R3 or Rn minus a ball. And the boundary is just this. And because this C, set C is compact, the boundary has to be compact as well. Okay? Because it's compact, it can consist, still consist of multiple components, yeah, but finitely many compact components, and we don't make any assumptions about their topology. And, but when we talk about these sigmas that I introduced last class, the black hole horizons, what I will, the language I will use is that each connected component is one horizon. So the, if the boundary is not connected, we will just have multiple black holes if all of them are black holes. Okay. So, not necessarily connected. Connected. 
expand static horizons sigma and minus one are connected. So a picture like this. shows you what I mean. So down here we would have our compact set C and the boundary of, bar, of, of MN then has two components and each of them could or could not be a static black hole horizon uh, depending on whether the function N vanishes and the mean curvature vanishes. Okay, and then there was a third question that was already asked in the auditorium and I didn't get it correctly and then it was again asked to me and maybe you could come up later and give me your name so I can thank you in the lecture notes. And there was, uh, the question was whether a set that has n equals zero in the Riemannian manifold is necessarily the, the cross section of a killing horizon. And the answer is no, and I was given an example that I wanted to share because it's very similar to the metric that we discussed yesterday, but different. So n equals zero, t equals zero does not have to be the cross section of a killing horizon. And the example is a metric that looks like this. And it doesn't even matter in which dimension I do this, where n is 1 minus 2m1 over r, and f looks almost the same, but with a different mass. So if those were the same masses, this would again be one of, the one of the metrics we studied carefully last class. But now these have different mass parameters. And if we assume that 0 is less than m1 is less than m2, then n equals 0 is, is, a, is a hypersurface. Yeah, and we cross it with t equals 0. So it has such a set. And that set here in this example coincides with when r is 2m1 and t is 0. Yeah, as, as usual, but now we have to be careful to, to know which mass. But upstairs, n equals 0 is not a killing horizon. because it's not a null hypersurface. The horizons should be null hypersurfaces. And how you can see that it's not a null hypersurface is by computing its normal and checking the causal character of the normal. And if you compute the normal to the n equals 0 set looking at this, it will be f times dr. And f is this function at 2m1 is not 0. So this, doesn't, this makes complete sense. And this normal is space-like. So it's, it's a time-like hypersurface and not a null hypersurface. OK. So much for the bad news. The good news is that this doesn't create any problems for us because if you compute the mean curvature of this surface here, call this sigma, if you compute the mean curvature of this surface sigma and try to compute it because it's at the boundary again in the three-dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold or n-dimensional Riemannian manifold, then it degenerates to infinity. So you cannot extend the Riemannian metric in t equals 0 to this boundary. So Riemannian part g 
gd one on f squared dr squared plus r squared d omega squared does not extend to r equals 2m1. And in particular, the mean curvature is r approaches 2m1 goes up to infinity. Okay, so in the Riemannian picture, this is an inner boundary, and this inner boundary has n equals zero, so n extends nicely to it, but the Riemannian metric does not extend nicely to it, and indeed its mean curvature even blows up <coughs> in this setting. So this wouldn't be one of the surfaces we would be allowed to consider in our setup because we asked that the Riemannian metric also extends to the inner boundary. So this is not going to cause us any problems. Besides, it actually doesn't solve vacuum Einstein equations anyway, but even if it did, it wouldn't shock us now. Okay, great. So now to black hole uniqueness. So what do I even mean by black hole uniqueness? By black hole uniqueness, I mean the only static vacuum black hole in three plus one dimensions, which is isolated, could be Schwarzschild. And this is still very imprecise, right? So we can do it differently and we can ask a question. We can ask a question, question one, can there exist? any single isolated black hole. And I'll use BH as the abbreviation for black hole from now on in vacuum. Which is in static equilibrium. with itself and not Schwarzschild. The answer to this question would be no, which is why it's called black hole uniqueness. This is in the single black hole case. And the intuitive reasoning why you may be expecting such a thing goes like this. Imagine you have a single isolated black hole which sits in vacuum and is in static equilibrium, so it doesn't move. It's isolated from all other influences, so there are no external forces coming from very far away on it. It's in vacuum, so there are no external forces coming from any matter around it. It's a single black hole, so there are no other black holes exerting any gravitational forces on it. So no external forces, full stop. But also, it, it's only a surface, right? It's only a horizon of a black hole, so there's no internal structure which could be in any way inhomogeneous. So there's also no intrinsic reason why it could be anything but spherically symmetric. So we can expect, and, it, and it's static, so there can all be dynamical forces pulling on it and making it into, say, an ellipsoid, like the, the Earth that rotates, right? So there's no pull on it at all, except its own gravitation, and there's no reason to anticipate it shouldn't be spherically symmetric. But if it's spherically symmetric, in addition to having all these other properties, then we're exactly in the scenario where Schwarzschild looked for solutions. And the only ones he found, and he made a construction that is not losing anything on the way, is Schwarzschild. So once we recovered spherical symmetry, intuitively at least for now, we recovered that this is Schwarzschild. Okay, this is the intuitive argument. Of course, this is not a proof, and we will see that the proof goes entirely differently, and I am not aware of any proof idea that uses any of these notions explicitly. And the main reason for this, I believe, is that we don't have a notion of force in relativity, and neither do we have a notion of acceleration, which would make us in, put us in the position to use a notion of force 
okay? And we, we don't have definitions of these notions, so we need to do without them. And you will see that the proofs work entirely differently than this intuitive argument. But why you would even study such a problem arises from this intuitive argument. Okay, so now here to question two. What about configurations of multiple black holes? Multiple such black holes and static equilibrium. And the answer again is cannot occur. So depending on whether you're a physicist or a mathematician, you read this, you read multiple to include one or not. If you read multiple as to include one, then cannot occur is not the right answer, then the right answer should be, then you have to be Schwarzschild as well. And we will see that in the theorem next class. Okay, so but, but here let's read multiple as, as, as an everyday person or as I believe physicists do and, and, and exclude one. Um, okay, so, so why is, is that intuitively? Well, if we had multiple, say, at least two black holes that were in static equilibrium, they would gravitationally attract each other, and that would make them accelerate, and that would make them be non-static, which is not the scenario we're looking at, so no. So then that means there's only one, and if there's only one, we already know that the, the intuitive answer should be, the, it should be Schwarzschild. Okay, yes? Pardon? Oh, the, just repeat the argument? Okay, so if you had two black holes or more in static equilibrium, they would exert gravitational pull on each other, which should make them accelerate towards each other, which makes them stop being static, and there's only static, static configurations, right? Um, and then that we're back in case one. <coughs> so what we'll do today is we'll study carefully a proof of this by Israel. This was the first proof that was ever given of any kind of static vacuum black hole uniqueness in 1967. And tomorrow we'll, we'll study the multiple black hole case with a proof by Bunting and Masudu Lalam from the 80s. Yes? Pardon? That's a very good question. We're going to translate these questions to math statements in a second. The asymptotics are hidden in the word isolated. Okay, so let's translate it to mathematics. So what's a single black hole? in static equilibrium. Will of course be a static space time. Or let's write static system in the terminology we introduced yesterday, M3GN. It's easier to handle with closed And in particular, the single saying connected. In a boundary. Which is a static horizon. As defined last class. Recall this means that both G and N extend smoothly to the surface and the mean curvature is zero and the laps N is also zero. Isolated will be translated to mathematics by saying that M3 G N is asymptotically Schwarzschildian. with 
cosa más. M and R. Vacuum will be, of course, translated to the vacuum equations that I told you that come from the Einstein equations in vacuum. And I'll rewrite them for convenience. And I, I introduced the name static vacuum equations for them. And then if instead of single black hole, we have multiple of black holes, we will have partial M, the boundary consisting of a union of finitely many, a disjoint union as we discussed yesterday, of finitely many surfaces, sigma 2i, and sigma 2i is a static horizon. and connected. Okay, so in the single black hole case, the boundary is connected, and in the multiple black hole case, the boundary is disconnected, and each component is a single black hole. So we, we can take, now let's focus on the one black hole case. So the boundary of all the manifolds we're looking at will be connected, yes? Pardon? By inner? Oh, there is, in, typically if you say you have an annulus, you have an inner boundary and an outer boundary, okay? If we have an asymptotically flat, uh, asymptotically Schwarzschildian manifold, there are several different ways of drawing them. Let me draw them like this now. So here's our black hole horizon. Here's where S goes to infinity. And in some sense, we call this the inner boundary because this is the infinitely far away outer boundary. Very good question. And actually, I wanted to draw exactly this picture anyway to tell you that I'm also using a very funny convention that is used in this field on the orientation of the normal, which is going to confuse you also. <laughs> so we're calling a normal in this direction. Nu is always going to be denoted normal. This is going to be the inner normal, uh, the other, sorry, the outer normal, <laughs> because it points out to infinity. So this is the outward unit normal. An hour meaning pointing to infinity. If you're a geometer and you don't typically work with asymptotically flat things, your outward would point exactly the opposite direction because it would point out of the manifold. Here, out always means towards the infinity, and if you read papers on asymptotically flat or asymptotically Schwarzschildian manifolds, some of them are like some of them in the archive at least are wrong because they cite theorems and use the wrong orientation of the normal. <laughs> so this is a really delicate issue. So, so I'll say it again, for me an outward unit normal to any surface in an asymptotically Schwarzschildian manifold will always point towards the infinity, not this way. Okay, then automatically,
by the Gauss-Kodatsi equations, the static vacuum equations four over there imply that several things are constant. So first, they imply that h is zero on sigma two. And this is, in fact, also true for multiple black holes. So I'll put in a little i in, in brackets there to indicate that if there are several black holes, it's true on each individual one individually. OK? What is this? This is the second fundamental form of this boundary surface inside the three-manifold. Manif three so second <laughs> fundamental form, extrinsic curvature, whatever name you prefer, of sigma 2 equals, in this single case, the boundary of M3 in M3 vanishes. We already assumed that the mean curvature vanishes. This is telling you that the trace-free part of the mean curvature is also vanishing. Okay. So the trace-free part is defined as h minus in two dimensions one half trace h times sigma, and the trace is also with respect to sigma, where sigma is the induced metric on sigma 2. So, okay, so we have our surface sigma 2 sitting inside our space M3, which has a metric, and also, of course, a left function. And then it has a second fundamental form with respect to the normal pointing outward to infinity. And the mean curvature was assumed to be zero. And now, automatically from the static vacuum equations, we also get that the trace-free part as defined there is also zero, okay? Which means, if you're not familiar with this, it's called conformal also, uh, so sorry, umbilic, which means if you stand at any point on the surface in normal direction, like you stand on the earth, and you rotate in your tangent, and look at your tangent space at, the, at your field point, the curvature of what you're looking at is the same in each direction. Right? Now, the mean curvature is also zero, so then the curvature is flat. The extrinsic curvature vanishes. But this vanishing, I can finish the sentence. This vanishing of the trace-free part of the second fundamental form alone just tells you the curvature is the same in each direction and doesn't depend on the angle. And I will maybe not be able to stop myself to call surfaces with this condition umbilic. So this is the name for this condition. Okay, so this just follows from the equation. Another thing that just follows from the equation, number two, is that the normal derivative of n, where, um, how would you write this? Nabla nu n, or the inner product of the gradient of n with nu, or dn nu, it's all the same thing. I'll write it this way, is constant on sigma two. So the, level, the normal, the, the left function n is zero on the surface, and its normal derivative is a constant, so it's independent of the foot point on the surface. That's what this is saying. To those who know what that means, this is equivalent to the surface gravity being a constant. And again, if the surface had multiple components, this would be true on each component, but it would be a different constant potentially on each component. And then a third thing that holds automatically is that the scalar curvature of the metric sigma, so the scalar curvature of this two-dimensional surface, or in other words, the Gauss curvature is constant as well. So, um, So 
So we know very, very much about the intrinsic and extrinsic geometry of a static horizon in a static vacuum um, space-time. Yes? Yes? We, we, we assume the mean curvature to be zero. Capital H. So this is, this is the capital H um, we assume to be zero. Okay, so we're assuming the mean curvature to be zero in order to, for it to be a horizon, so a minimal surface condition. And then we get for free that it's also umbilic from the static equations by gauss kodatsi Okay? Pardon? This is R with an index sigma, yeah. Okay, we can rewrite it more freely. Thanks. More questions? Okay. <clears throat> and this is for those of you who are interested in doing homework, to verify this by explicit computations can be your first homework exercise for today. <laughs> Exercise six. Okay, so here comes the theorem. And in the original version, let me first write that it's by Isaiah 1967, and the precise reference is in the references I gave you yesterday. So Israel, when he first wrote this down, he put enormous amounts of conditions that I'm not going to write. Because today, partially because we know these things a priori, we don't need to assume them anymore. So some of the, he, for one thing he assumed, for example, was this. But today we know it follows anyway. Okay, so I'm not going to write it in the original version. I'm just going to write it in a way that it makes sense today. So let M3. Gn be a static system vacuum asymptotic to Schwarzschild of some mass. M bigger than zero with a single black hole boundary. Human addition. This is a new condition that we haven't seen yet, that the uh, differential of n doesn't vanish anywhere in M3. Then the corresponding space-time is isometric globally. To the, to the Schwarzschild space time of mass M. Okay, so this assumption is essential for the proof that Israel gave, as you will see. And it really is meant as there is no point where it vanishes, not there is some point where it doesn't vanish. Yeah, it's nowhere vanishing.
And before I show you anything about the proof, um, let me show what this condition allows us to do. And that, of course, will be then useful in the proof. But let me first not mention anything from the proof explicitly anyway. So the condition that dn is non-zero in M3 n on sigma 2, of course, is 0 because it's a static horizon, tells us some sense automatically that this is connected. Why is that? Well, this says that n actually does something which is called foliating the manifold. So the condition that the gradient doesn't vanish anywhere by the implicit function theorem tells you that each point in the manifold lies exactly in one level set of the Lebesgue function. Yeah? So and these are my names for the level sets. This is the level set of value n. Okay? Level sets foliate M3, and because the horizon has n equals 0, it's one of the level sets of this foliation, OK, the horizon. We call before sigma 2, but in this new language, we could also call it sigma 2, 0, as a level set in this foliation, the most inner one. And asymptotically, n goes like 1 minus m over r, s, yeah? Asymptotically, by assumption, n is like 1 minus m over s plus lower order terms. And this implies that n goes to 1. And for n equals 1 minus a small epsilon, we have that sigma 1 minus epsilon is approximately a large sphere. Of some radius. OK, so the asymptotics of this n are almost such that if this, if this wasn't there, then n being constant would mean s being constant. OK, but s is the radius in our coordinate system. So that would be a large sphere with radius s that you can compute. This is 1 minus epsilon. So epsilon would be m over s. So s would be m over epsilon. OK? So now there are lower order terms. So this is only an approximate identity. So then, of course, from this condition, we don't only know, bless you, that the level sets foliate the manifold. We also know that they all have the same topology. And of course, large spheres have spherical topology, so which means that all of them have spherical topology. And in particular, they are connected. So this argument shows us that our horizon sigma 2, 0 is a connected surface, and in particular is a sphere. So this already allowed us to fix the topology of this boundary. And it shows us that the assumption that we have a single black hole is actually superfluous, and we could have dropped it, because it follows from this together with the asymptotics. Okay, let me say this again. 
in practice, we wouldn't need to write this assumption here because it follows from this non-degeneracy condition of the, of the differential of n, as I explained. In particular, also, it follows that it's a sphere. Now, if you look back at, at this condition, r sigma, the scalar curvature being constant, if we know it's a sphere and the scalar curvature is constant, then this constant has to be positive by gauss bonnet theorem. So in, 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 in our three, we have that this is a constant, and indeed, this must be a positive constant by gauss bonnet So maybe it's now a good time for a picture. So I'll draw it here. So now I'm looking from the top onto the Riemannian manifold. I'm not drawing it curved. I'm just drawing it flat. And then we have our boundary of M3, which is sigma 2, which is also sigma 2, 0 in our foliation. Being part of a foliation here where we have Sigma 2, say, n equals 1 half. And uh, here we have a leaf. Sigma 2, n equals 3 quarters. And then maybe a little bit further out. Again, we have a leaf. Sigma n is. 7 over 8, or, or, and so on. We never reach 1, because 1 is at the infinity of the manifold, OK? But this is like a set of concentric spheres, only we don't know they're round, we don't know they're concentric, and the background is curved. But intuitively, we have this foliation by these spheres. Topologically, we know they're spheres. And we know the inner one is a round sphere, because we know it has constant scalar curvature. But the others don't need to be round. Right? They could be anything, but topologically, they're spheres. Also, we don't know if they're extrinsically round, so what is their second fundamental form, except for the horizon where we know it's extrinsically flat. Okay. Another thing that we can learn from the asymptotics is the following. Um, we said last time that the static vacuum equations imply that the function n is harmonic. And as a consequence of this, by the divergence theorem, in fact, the integral over sigma to n, and now it's n1, of the normal derivative of n dA, where this is the area measure with respect to sigma, sigma. So let's go in this picture. Now on each of these surfaces, we have a normal nu pointing towards infinity and an induced metric Sigma, we're going to give them all the same names. And the second fundamental form, H, and the mean curvature, capital H, anything else? I don't think so. So we can take the normal derivative of n on any of these level sets and integrate with respect to the area measure of this um, over this surface. And because the function is harmonic, we will get, and this is the same as integrating the exact same thing 
of a, a different level set. So the integral of the normal derivative of n over this level set is the same as on this level set, is the same as on this level set, is the same as the integral over the horizon for any n1 and 2 in the range 0 to 1 that n takes, OK, by the divergence theorem. And then plugging in the asymptotics, of n and of g, we can compute that this integral, which is independent of any of these level sets, is equal to 4 pi times the mass. And this is another homework exercise for you. So in particular, on the horizon, the integral over nu of n dA is 4 pi m. And we assumed m to be positive. This tells us that nu of n is positive. Well, so far, we only knew it's a constant. Or vice versa, if we assume the surface gravity nu of n to be positive, then we know that the mass is positive, Okay, as we like. So now this constant is positive and this constant is positive, and I can erase this. Now, what else can we learn from this? We know n is 0, and I already implicitly used it in here. n is 0 on this, and n goes out to, in, to 1 here. So n is increasing. n is increasing to infinity uh, from, from 0 to 1 as s goes to infinity. But if n is increasing, wait a second, then the normal derivative of n must be positive. So we didn't need to assume that anyway, yeah? So this implies also that nu and n is positive, and this implies that m is positive. So Israel wouldn't have needed to assume this either. And there were some other conditions, as I said, that I didn't write. Yeah? But this is just the conventional way to write it. So let me say again, we know from uh, the gauss kodatsi version of the static equations that nu of n is a constant on the horizon. From the fact that n is growing or increasing, we know that nu of n is positive, so it's a positive constant on the horizon. OK. Um, OK, so now let's begin with the proof. And the basic idea is already hidden in some of the things I've said. The basic idea is to use n as sort of a radial coordinate in the space. As a radial. in M3. So in order to make it coordinates, we still need two other functions, because we're in a three-dimensional manifold. So what Israel did now 
is he says, okay, we know this is a round sphere, so let's just take theta and phi as coordinates on this. And n is a coordinate in this the function in this direction, which is increasing. So, and it has no vanishing, never vanishing gradient. So we can use n, the gradient of n to flow these coordinates out to infinity. So we can take theta and phi on the surface, the angular coordinates, and flow them out and have coordinates theta and phi everywhere. They don't, might not mean the thing we know, we, we, they usually know, but they're nice coordinate functions. I'll write that down. Choose. Let's call them y1 and y2, or in other words, y capital I. Now my capital indices are one and two only. Um, um, on boundary from three, the sigma two, the sigma two zero, and flow them flow into all of M three to get coordinates. Uh, sorry, along right gradient of n with respect to the three metric to get coordinates n y1, y2 on m3. Now, if you're worried this won't work globally, um, this condition that the gradient doesn't vanish tells you that it works globally in n direction. But of course, on the sphere, we don't have global coordinates. So in reality, you will need to do this on a patch on the sphere, and then you'll get coordinates here, and then on a different patch on the sphere. But I'll completely gloss over that detail. So now that we have these coordinates, they are super useful to study the problem. And let's introduce one more name. Let's introduce a function rho to be a function on M3 given as 1 over the normal derivative of n. So it's a little bit stupid. I drew, drew the picture right over there, so I have to walk back and forth all the time. <laughs> so now for any point, this function rho is defined as follows. Take a point in the manifold. It will sit exactly on one of those level sets. So it will have a value of n, and that will be its n coordinate, and it will also have a y1 and a y2 coordinate, of course but it also will have a normal derivative of n to this surface evaluated at it. This is a number, and this is how the function rho works. And because n is growing, this is a positive function. Okay, so this is really a function on M3. And if you do the computation, you can rewrite the metric G of our space by writing it as rho squared dn squared plus sigma, where sigma is the metric on the, the uh, surface sigma 2n to which the point belongs. So if we have a point, it belongs to one of the sigma 2n's. This is the induced metric on, on this surface. This is dn at this point, and this row is evaluated as I just explained at this point. So this is how you can rewrite the metric. This looks familiar to Schwarzschild. That's because it works for Schwarzschild as well. Okay? So this we have. And how to compute this is by the chain rule. Okay, now that we have this, we still have the static vacuum equations that we know to hold, and we can plug in, plug in this form of the metric into the static vacuum equations. Okay, and if you do that, we can take exactly the same approach as you do when you split the Einstein equations into constraints and evolution equations, and now split the static vacuum equations for into constraints and evolution equations for the function rho and the metric sigma. Now 
put quotes on evolution because it's not really evolution in time, it's evolution in n. And then you get tons of equations. Oh, that isn't a good idea. I leave the theorem. You get, you get tons of equations. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to forget some of them, but keep the following three. And I'm going to write them and then say something about them. And they look awful. The last one is a little shorter. Okay, so rho we introduced, h is the mean curvature, n is the coordinate n, h comma n is the partial derivative with respect to the coordinate n of the mean curvature. This is the Laplacian with respect to sigma, and all the remaining things I believe should be clear. Um, so these are, this is an evolution equation for rho, this, and these two seem to look like evolution equations for h. Um, on each sigma to n, where n is in 0 and 1. And of course, we're dividing by n, so we need to be a little bit more careful, but we gloss over those details here. All of these can made, be made sense of also in the limit n going to zero. Okay, and now here comes the second cool idea by Israel. We introduce a number or a function tau as the determinant of the matrix sigma ij. So this is the matrix of sigma with respect to these angular coordinates that we chose, and we take its determinant. Think of this as the um, the quantity you want to take the square root out if you want to compute the area element, okay? And this is how we're going to use it. That's one thing, and then the other thing is then I want you to notice that the bracket is positive, is not negative. Okay, there's a square and there's a square. Okay, so what he does now is he takes the first two and transforms them into inequalities by dropping the bracket. And he uses this quantity, introduces this quantity and writes down two very nice inequalities between all the things in here, including the tau. 
Okay. So drop the square brackets. Then we get two nice density inequalities. The partial n derivative of the following thing. Square root of tau h square root of rho n is less than or equal to minus 2 square root of tau divided by n, Laplacian sigma of square root of rho. And the other one is partial derivative root n square root of tau over rho times hn plus 4 over rho is less than or equal to minus n square root of tau Laplacian sigma of ln rho plus r sigma. Okay, this is a matter of computation. It's a bit, little bit lengthy, but there's nothing ingenious going on at all. And all of these equations you can find in slightly different language in Heusler's book, or I'll give you a reference at the end of, of the last class to, to a paper of mine where you can find them in this notation. Yes? That's a very good question. The initial, the row is like one on nu of n, right? And nu of n was a constant on the horizon, and that constant gives you the initial condition. And same for h, h starts like zero, yeah? Okay, so now, as she already indicated, this is very nice to look at as kind of an, also an evolution inequality for the term, oops, in the braces. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna integrate it over n, and then integrate also over sigma two n. Uh, so integrate from zero to one, integrate uh, oops, sigma 2n, all of this. And now, of course, the integral from 0 to 1 is dn, and now we have to take a brief uh, moment to discuss how we integrate over sigma 2n. We already have what will be the functional determinant included in our inequalities as a square root in each term on each side. So we're not going to integrate square root of tau dy1, dy2, but we're instead going to integrate just dy1, dy2 because the, the functional determinant is already in here. dy1, dy2. Both inequalities. So if this happens, let's first look at, at the right-hand side. Both right-hand sides are proportional to this functional determinant, so we immediately recover the area element. Yeah? Square root of tau, dy1, dy2 is dA. So fine, great. So we're left with something that depends only on n, which is constant on sigma 2n, so it can be taken out of the interior integral, and something with the, which is a Laplacian. Now, an integral over a Laplacian over a closed surface by the divergence theorem vanishes. Okay, so we use divergence theorem here. The exact same argument applies to this Laplacian of the logarithm. Here, we get an integral over the scalar curvature over the surface. By gauss bonnet we can compute this explicitly. We already know it's a sphere, so we get a number. Divergence theorem. So we've treated the right-hand sides. On the left-hand sides, we're going to do a Fubini theorem to, to interchange the order of integration, which allows us to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to get rid of this derivative. Fubini. 
in fundamental theorem calculus. And then we can complete, completely explicitly compute everything. And because by the fundamental theorem, we just need to evaluate these expressions without the square root of tau because it, it disappears into the area element for n equals 1 and for n equals 0 at the boundaries of the integral. Okay, for n equals 1, this means we need to exploit the asymptotics that we've prescribed. And for n equals 0, it means we need to use the initial conditions that we prescribed on the horizon. Okay, so asymptotics. Plus conditions on horizon. And all of this together leads us to certain numerical inequalities between the only things that we have. And so quantities at infinity is the only quantity at infinity we know is m. So all the things that we compute by exploiting asymptotics will depend on m. That will be m or m squared or square root of m or something. And the conditions on the horizon, all the numbers are zero except uh, the scalar curvature. And, which is a positive constant, and the normal derivative of the lapse, which is a positive constant. These two constants we still have. And so if we express everything in terms of these, what we get is 1 on 4 nu of n at n equals 0. And also, let's call this 12. And also, the area of sigma 2 divided by 4 pi is less, is bigger than or equal to um, 1 on 4 nu of n at n equals 0 squared, 13. But we also have, which was called 5, this integral identity that the area of any of these guys divided by 4 pi equals um, times nu of n and n equals 0 m. Recall we said the integral over nu of n divided by 4 pi is m. Now, I'm, because nu of n is a constant, I can take it out of the integral and just get the area. Okay? So now we have, this involves three quantities, the mass, the normal derivative, which we know is a positive constant, and the area of the horizon. The area is a good replacement for the scalar curvature by gauss bonnet So these are the three numbers we have. And we have two inequalities and one identity. And the magic is that the, the, the directions of these inequalities are exactly opposite. So all of this can only hold true if both of these have to be identities. Okay, so this implies by a computation that equality holds in 12 and 13. So here comes the full magic of this. We derived lots of equations. From those, we dropped positive or non-negative terms to get inequalities. Then we, we integrated these inequalities, simplified everything, plugged in everything we knew, and got inequalities. These inequalities are identities. So everything we ever integrated also had to be identities, which means that this, the content of this square bracket had to be zero to begin with. Because they're both positive, this means that each, now each level set is umbilic. And on each level set, rho, so nu of n, is a constant. Okay? I don't have room to write this anywhere. I'll write it here in a color. So this is from above. The square bracket is 0. So h circle is 0, and uh, rho is constant, and that's nu of n is constant on each 
sigma 2n. We started knowing that this is true on the horizon. Now we know it on each leaf of the foliation in this picture. Okay? And now if you plug this information back into 7, 8, and 9, rho being independent of the angles tells you rho n is also independent of the angles, so h is constant as well. on each of them. So each of them is now a constant mean curvature surface, which is umbilic, and has constant nu of n. We already started by knowing they have constant n, because that's how we define them. Then let's look at this. Now all of this is independent of the angles. This is independent of the angles. This is zero, so the scalar curvature is also constant. So all of these things are constant, or zero even, on each leaf. So now each leaf is intrinsically a round sphere and extrinsically a round sphere in the sense that it's umbilic and it has constant mean curvature. Okay. And in fact, these equations, if we use them quantitatively and not just qualitatively as I just did, we can compute all these constants in terms of n. Okay? And then this allows us to explicitly compute that everything is Schwarzschild. Okay? Okay, so this is really a fun idea to, sp to split everything as a problem on surfaces. And of course, we made tremendous use of this condition, which looks like a little bit of a technical assumption because how many critical points will a harmonic function even have? Yeah? So now is the question that somebody already asked last time, like why do we make so much regularity assumptions? That, that you can interpret as a regularity assumption as well. And there's a generalization of this. I need to look up the names so I don't say anything bad by by Müller zum Hagen. Robinson and someone called Seifert from 1973. The reference is in the Heusler book. Who, who take this argument and use more advanced techniques and a lot of knowledge about harmonic functions to to reduce the amount of the number of points where this can happen so much that they can actually go through them and, and get rid of this condition. Okay? Get rid of. And at the same time, they also get rid of a lot of the other regularity assumptions that we made, as you asked the yes, last class. Also, much lower regularity at the horizon. Regularity at the horizon. And let's end here for today. Thanks.